Saluton kai bonvenon al alasa programo on si chui serio. And for those of you who don't speak Esperanto, I've just said hello and welcome to the last program in the adventure of English. It's often argued that the modern world needs a common language with which to communicate. That's why Esperanto was invented in the late 19th century, with a dream of providing an artificial second language for all the people of the world. There have been numerous attempts at similar schemes, but none of them anywhere near as popular as the language which spread by natural selection through the 20th century, English. English can now claim to be a global language more so than any other language in history. I'm in Chicago, the Windy City. The 20th century could be said to begin here. In 1871, a fire had destroyed old Chicago, but within two years, an entire new city was built for a new century. With a huge charge of economic and technical development, America was about to burst onto the global stage. The German Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, said near the end of the 19th century, the decisive element of modern history is the fact that the North Americans speak English. But there were now two Englishes, or one language that we might call English-American or American-English. And the story of the last century is how these two Englishes have grown together, sometimes in harmony, sometimes in competition. America was flexing its economic muscles at that time, and the words and phrases reflect that big business, executive, well-heeled, fat cat, go-getter, and yes man, as well as assembly line and clothes shop, they're all American English. Europe had its towers, but it took America to build and to name that quintessential image of the country, the skyscraper. The first skyscraper ever was built here in Chicago in 1885. It's been knocked down, but this one was built soon afterwards. It's now the oldest one still standing in Chicago. Now, it's a hotel. Hotel, in the modern sense, is an American word. In French, it just meant a large private house. And it was in America that they first called this reception area a lobby, with its desk clerk, I mean clerk, dressed in black, of course, at the front desk, his bellhop, and its concierge, another European word given its modern meaning in America. To get to your penthouse, if you should be so lucky, you would, of course, need an elevator. English already had the rather less technical word lift, but as Oscar Wilde inevitably said, we have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. You can see it everywhere, and a hotel gives us quite a few examples. In England, we would have a wardrobe. This is a closet. In England, we would have a bathroom. Well, that's the same, but it could also be called a washroom. A tub with a faucet, not a bath with a tap. And when we go into the bedroom, well, at least that's the same word, we find that the window has drapes, not curtains. The bed has covers, not bedclothes. Instead of a dressing gown, here's a bathrobe. Beside the bed, there's a nightstand, not a bedside table. And somewhere, there's a trash can, not a waste paper basket. The British had long looked down on the way the Americans used the language. Coleridge thought the word talented was a vile and barbarous American word. But it was, in fact, English. Dickens noted how they corrupted the language with words like reliable and lengthy. There's always been some perhaps misinformed resistance to American words, but the Americans have never cared much for English opinion about their use of the English language. The poet Walt Whitman observed in 1888 that American English was the apotheosis of slang, a glorious new language, he said, reinvented away from the traditions and authority of British English. Hey, Mark, we got a problem. I, I don't have the chicken wings. I ordered them two days ago. Let's go for the wishbone omelet. Wishbone? Yeah. And with the omelet, you also get a corn muffin, a biscuit, or toast. You guys got growth. 
Okay, right. Yeah, it's awesome. awesome. You should get apple maple or chicken and dewy. The psychiatry is lifted. We should point out that the increase um, will not be any more than the savings. Right. Okay. Were they writing over 2,600 and a quarter? All righty. In Britain, correct English was linked with manners, morals, and, of course, class. Just as one had to keep a straight bat and hold one's knife and fork correctly, so one had to use the right word. Use the wrong one, and you could be caught out. And Wardian English abhorred flamboyance. When somebody wrote of Rupert Brooke, the young poet who died during the First World War, that he'd left Cambridge University in a blaze of glory, the poet's mother crossed out that melodramatic phrase and replaced it with a single word. It read, he left Cambridge University in July. In part, it was a case of British formality versus American informality. American was thought to be a classless version of English, and there were those in Edwardian society who found that idea difficult to tolerate. But the First World War would test and change most of them. Edwardian English, like its Victorian parent, loved pageantry, pomp, and a society where every word knew its place. The trenches of the First World War detonated much of that. The First World War gave us new figures of speech as well as a vision of equality here in the trenches. Before the war, if you were in trouble or under pressure, you might have said you'd been thrown like a horse rider into a wasteland or a swamp, perhaps under a shower of criticism. Words drawn from peaceful country life. After 1918, you'd probably say you were being bombarded uh, under a barrage, shell-shocked, or in no man's land. The First World War gave British English firepower and front line, gas mask and camouflage, bonk for to shell with artillery, and dud for defective round. The balloon goes up was the signal for the artillery to open fire at zero hour. Over the top comes from the terrifying moment of climbing out of the trench. The biblical phrase, at the 11th hour, gained a new meaning from the time the final ceasefire was declared on Armistice Day. All terms from the very end of World War I. When the armistice finally came, more than the First World War was over, it underlined what was already a trend, the shift of power in many areas, including language, to America. While Europe had been burning, the USA had experienced massive industrial expansion. The factories of the northern states needed new workers, and the poor of the south, many of the descendants of former slaves, saw the opportunity they offered and moved in. The migrants, overwhelmingly black, came along tracks like these and railroads like these. They came to the cities of the north, cities like Chicago, pounding with growth then and pounding with growth now. And they changed America. They also changed the English language. In the 19th century, almost all Afro-Americans had lived in the south. By the end of the century, 95% were up in the north. And they injected a new energy into the language. They brought African speech, African rhythm, new vocabulary. We're gonna boogie, we're gonna boogie, we're gonna boogie, we're gonna get in the groove, we're gonna do these boogie blues. What brought black and white together and put black speech into mainstream American was music, first jazz, then blues. New words and expressions started to accompany the soundtrack of what America is perhaps best known for, popular culture. Today, the language would be unimaginable without its colonization by words and expressions of black and African origin. The very words jazz and blues arrived from Afro-American speech at the beginning of the century. The African word hippicat, meaning attuned to the environment or with his eyes open, gave us hepcat and later hip and cat. Later still, of course, its meaning grew to include the idea of hippie. White American embraced black American speech when people started to dance the hoochie-coochie and then the cakewalk, the shimmy, jive and boogie woogie. And perhaps it was the sex in black music that seduced white America. Jazz itself may originally have been a word meaning to have sex. Later on, rock and roll certainly was. Jelly roll, cherry pie and custard pie were all words for the female organ. Shack up in the sense of living together comes from black speech at this time too. Black American expressions are now so mainstream that it's forgotten almost all Americans, and very many British, including almost all youth, now speak some sort of black. 
Young people want to be cool or bad, which was first recorded as meaning good in America in 1928. Others might want to be groovy or mellow, which came from melody in jazz circles in the early 40s. Square is out, but it may come back. Thank you. Thank you. But it wasn't just black words flooding into American English in the early 20th century. Around that time, the country's population nearly doubled in just 30 years, mainly due to incomers from Central and Eastern Europe. As more Europeans migrated here and began to speak English, words from their own languages came with them. And American English, like English English before it, was ready and able to soak them all up. And what was once foreign now sounds apple pie American English. If this coffee had been really hot, someone might have said ouch from the German word ouch, A-U-T-S-C-H, as well as hamburger and frankfurter. The Germans gave us words like wanderlust, seminar, dumb for stupid, and even the game of poker from the German potchen. Bum, meaning tramp, comes from bummler, a good for nothing, hold on from halt an, and so long from the German zolange. Zolange itself may have originally come from the Yiddish shalom. Bagels, lox, pastrami, and borscht became part of our nosh, another Yiddish word. Soon, German and Yiddish speech patterns flooded the language, and by the end of the century, we would all quite naturally be using turns of phrase such as, am I hungry? I'm telling you. Now he tells me, could I use a drink? I should worry. And there was plenty to worry about in the 1920s. The prohibition of alcohol encouraged gangsters, and in a garage on this unremarkable site, seven men were mown down by Al Capone's mob in the notorious St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It was a time of racketeers and hatchet men, of goons and finks. If you took the rap for a heist, you might find yourself in the can or even in the hot seat, especially for a hijack with a submachine gun. A woman was a chick, a bimbo, a broad or a babe, and a telephone was a blower. We learned not to spill the beans or we'd be taken for a ride and to avoid gimmicks and pranksters, junkies, pushers and the fuzz. And when we'd rank hooch, we had to watch out for a Mickey Finn. Gangsters are forever linked with the movies, never more so than here. John Dillinger, the FBI's public enemy number one, was gunned down as he left the Biograph movie theatre in 1934. He was fingered or betrayed by his companion, the notorious Lady in Red. She's still here. Now beat it, you two mugs, before I lose my temper. By the 1930s, motion pictures and sound had been united, and the talkies were in full swing, bringing a new vocabulary. Going to the movies, at a movie theater, or Nickelodeon, was a national pastime. You could see the stars, in close-up, in a weepy, or a tearjerker, laugh at some slapstick, or be gripped by a spine chiller, or a cliffhanger. While the usherette was selling ices, you could watch a trailer for next week's show. You might even dream of going for a screen test yourself. More than anything else, the talking picture would be the engine to spread American ideas and American English from Hollywood, around the country, and then around the globe over the next century. Hey, where's the guy that hit me? Put him up. Oh. Come on, get over here. Hey, come in. But back in Britain, their language caused an outrage. The words and accent were perfectly disgusting. And there can be no doubt that such films are an evil influence on our society. Those truly loathsome transatlantic importations to help make worthwhile, nearby, and colorful are spreading like the plague. But with the popularity of Hollywood, those complaints were simply swept aside by most people in Britain. Films were starting to bring the two languages closer together. But despite the incursions of its vigorous cousin, English in the UK was alive and well with its own style and also with an awareness of American influence. P.G. Woodhouse defined himself in some measure by stressing Englishness, yet he was informal and up-to-date with phrase-making, as you can see for a couple of phrases. She had a penetrating sort of laugh 
rather like a train going into a tunnel. You could say first half Edwardian English, second half American English. Or there's such a thing as going too far, and you have gone it. Again, could be Edwardian and American. Woodhouse came to school here at Dulwich College in London, and he left to school his books and the desk on which he wrote many of them. And a writer regarded as the epitome of American style also came here to Dulwich College. Raymond Chandler was seven years younger than Woodhouse. He was born in Chicago, but came to England as a young boy and became naturalised British at the age of 19. From the Edwardian playing fields of Dulwich College came Blandings and Jeeves in a timeless England and the mean streets of L.A. and Philip Marlowe in a timeless America. Marlowe's the name of the house of this school. Just as Woodhouse played with British English, Chandler played with American English, making it elegant but tough. It was a blonde. A blonde to make a bishop kick a hole in a stained glass window. She gave me a smile I could feel in my hip pocket. In the year Chandler published the entertaining American prose of Farewell, My Lovely, Hitler was preparing to invade England and make German the common language of Europe. Different situations make different demands on a language. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight in the air. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. This is part of Churchill's war rooms underground behind Downing Street. And from this desk, he made his broadcasts to the nation. In 1940, Britain stood alone against Hitler. Winston Churchill made a speech which drew on the deep historical roots of the English language. It's a masterpiece of rhythm and rhetoric. Churchill had studied the speeches of Elizabeth I, and this has the same resolve as her words at Tilbury, which inspired the English to repulse the Spanish Armada. And it digs deeper into the history of English. All but a handful of words here can be traced back to Old English, the key vocabulary. We shall go on to the end. Fight, strength, island, landing, ground, field, street, hills, and never had all been part of English for more than a thousand years. Churchill was rallying some of the country's oldest words to the fight, not to the battle, that was a French word, and surrender too is a French word. The hostile Nazi invasion never came, but in 1942, a friendly American one did. Let the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. Nothing could reverse the effects of such sustained exposure to American English. The GIs introduced words like beef burger, crew cut and disc jockey, gizmo, gobbledygook, pin-up and GI bride. But the traffic was not all one way. The Americans published this book, A Short Guide to Great Britain, the War and Navy Department, Washington, D.C., for all their troops in this country. It's very friendly and, I think, acute about the British. The British are reserved, it says, but not unfriendly. Then it describes it. Don't show off, it says. The British dislike showing off. Don't say you've got too much money. You've got much more than the British. And don't show off about it. They learned how to eat. They learned that French fries were chips and a smoked herring was a kipper. They learnt that bowling alleys and ten pins were skittle alleys with nine pins. That a five and ten store should be called a bazaar, and that instead of OK, they should say, right ho. And they were told, the British are tough. Don't be misled by the British tendency to be soft-spoken and polite. The English language didn't spread across oceans, mountains, jungles and swamps of the world because these people were panty-wastes. panty, -wastes. panty -waste. That's American English for what the British would have called a sissy. By 1944, on the eve of D-Day, one and a half million United States soldiers were billeted around Britain. The Americans eventually returned home. But the language they brought with them has stayed ever since, and English was massively enriched. <laughs> In March 2000, the Pope made his historic first ever visit to Israel. On this important occasion, he addressed his hosts not in their own language, Hebrew, nor in the Vatican's official language, Latin, nor in his native Polish, but in English. May peace be thus given to the land he chose 
as his own. English has become the primary language of global communication, the most understood language in the world. So why has English become so important on the world stage? 19th century linguists felt that there was something special and unique about the language itself. In 1851, Jacob Grimm of the Brothers Grimm told the Royal Academy of Berlin that English was the strongest language because it had dropped all its complicated word endings. He wrote, of all modern languages, not one has acquired such great strength and vigor as the English, for none of the living languages can be compared with it as to richness, rationality, and close construction. You'd be hard pressed to find any linguist today who'd follow that line or even a less triumphalist argument put forward by another foreign scholar, the Dane, Otto Jespersen, in 1905. He wrote, the French language is like the stiff French garden of Louis XIV, while the English language is like an English park, in which you're allowed to walk everywhere without having to fear rigorous regulations. But most linguists today would agree not with the genius of Jacob Grimm, but with the linguistic scholar David Crystal, that the spread of a language has little to do with its intrinsic qualities. Social, political, and economic factors are now seen as the forces behind the spread of languages. There's a saying among linguists that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So a language that spreads just has more clout behind it. At the end of the Second World War, British and American troops were stationed as administrators in Europe and the Far East. In Japan, learning English became compulsory. In Germany, knowing English gave people an edge in dealing with officials and regulations after the Reich. And a world impoverished by the war turned its eyes enviously to the American dream. Now, the dream cars of tomorrow. Expressing not only the American love of beauty, but also the basic freedom of the American people. And the language of that dream was English, a language that came to represent the delights of consumption and consumerism, of material advance and its promise of happiness. But perhaps the most desirable consumer product at the end of the 20th century was first developed in England, in Manchester. It made the English language adapt and expand to a whole new vocabulary. In 1948, this was the state of the art of what the boffins were calling the electronic brain, the computing machine, or the electronic numerical integrator and computer. The baby, as this rather large piece of hardware was christened, was the first to store a digital program in its 2048-bit memory. In the years since baby received its first input of data, the computer and its vocabulary have embraced the microcircuit, the database, the chip, and the mouse, the floppy disk, and the hard disk. We've progressed from the mainframe to the desktop, the laptop to the handheld. And now even a cell phone like this can download information from the internet and with an estimated 85% of the world's web pages being written in English, this newest technology has become one of the great conduits taking the English language around the world. With the dollar leading the world economy in the latter part of the 20th century, English became the most significant trading language. Global trade in English is reckoned to be worth over $4,000 billion. That's three or four times as much as the next richest languages, Japanese and German. Though Chinese has more native speakers than English, trade conducted in Chinese is just one-tenth of the value of trade in English. Hello. Many design. Good play now. Can you choose what color do you like? I have a tie-dye and with pattern or plain color. Hello, you buy? There's an international rule that the seller speaks the buyer's language. If I want your money, it pays me to learn to talk to you in your language. It's the same on a larger scale, whether selling postcards to sightseers or raw materials to industrialists. English opens the purse strings. Here in India, some 40 million people speak English fluently, as if it were a first language, though mostly it's a second or third language. But it's reckoned that a third of the population here have some sort of familiarity with the language, and that's over 300 million people. And that pattern is repeated around the globe. Wherever there's a population of English speakers, you'll find a much larger number of people who come into contact with it and have some knowledge of it, or at least learning it. Now is the time to relax and enjoy the program. In the second half of the 20th century, the number of people speaking English as their first language has doubled to nearly 400 million. 
though it's still not as many as the 900 million who speak Mandarin Chinese. English is national language, international language. So I start English. I can use English language to speak with other people. Uh, I want to earn much money. <laughs> what I want to do today. However, there are another 500 million people around the world who are bilingual in English, or at least speak it fluently. It's here that the big expansion has taken place. The number has quadrupled in 50 years. But because of its usefulness as a second language, some thousand million other people are learning English in schools and colleges. Added together, that's about 2,000 million people, or a third of the world's population, who have some knowledge of English. It's an unprecedented expansion. English is now used as an official or semi-official language in over 60 countries around the world and plays a significant role in 20 more. English is now well established on all six continents. And it doesn't stop there, because in all sorts of ways, when nation needs to speak unto nation, they do it in English. <laughs> the uh, implementation of Lisbon, and that so gives you all the information. At the European Parliament in Strasbourg, business in the chamber is translated into all the languages of the member states. Ten years ago, French was the language most commonly used by delegates outside the chamber. Today, it's English. The President of the Parliament to the President of the Commission. Final European Parliament documents are translated into all languages, but it's the language they are drafted in that's changed. In 1970, 60% of EU documents were drafted in French and 40% in German. By 1997, 45% were drafted in English, 40% in French and 15% in other EU languages. English plays the leading role, not just here at the EU, but in international bodies all around the world. The United Nations, NATO, the World Bank and hundreds of other associations. English is important even when it's not the natural language of the major players. It's the only official language of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It's the working language of the European Free Trade Association, of the Association of Baltic Marine Biologists, the Asian Amateur Athletic Association, the European Association of Fish Pathology, and the African Hockey Federation. Whatever country they come from, most medical journals are published in English, like this one, the Japanese Journal of Biochemistry. It's not translated into English, it's published only in English. And its writers include Tatsuro Irimura, Hiryuki Takichuko, Kentaro Kato. Almost anywhere that a body wants to communicate with the world, or where they want access to the literature of international politics, ideas, culture and sport, you'll find English. In Germany, international corporations such as Daimler and Mercedes conduct important meetings in English, and thousands of English words have made their way into German speech and print, from accountant, acid trip and advertising agency, to yellow pages, yuppie and zappa. A movement has been started to hold back words for which there's already a German equivalent, though when it's a choice between pesticide and umkraut vernichtungsmittel, the smart money is on the import. But this opposition is nothing compared to France, where the tide of Franglais was seen as a national threat. Just as we took in thousands of French words in the Middle Ages, French speakers and writers today are taking on thousands of English and American expressions. A meeting. A loser. A surfer. A garden party. A basketball. Mobile. A downloader. A football. A score. A soft drink. Cheeseburger. A cocktail. A jumbo jet. A scotch, a sandwich, le parking, le poney club. So many English words made their way to France <laughs> that it became clear that something had to be done. And in 1994, the French government passed a law prohibiting the use of English words where good French equivalents existed on pain of a hefty fine. The British Parliament threatened retaliatory action if le loi tout bon, as it was called, was not watered down. But the most recent edition of the Académie Française Dictionary did admit about 6,000 new words to the French language, including for the first time a number of franglais words and expressions. But most of them are from the 1950s, such as le cover girl, le bestseller, and le blue jeans. Most of those in everyday use, from le weekend to le zoom, were excluded. It's not just the old English-French rivalry. Norway and Brazil have recently adopted similar measures to keep English out. It's the colourful words that people want to borrow from English, but the language used as a tool for international documents is a different matter.
This is a sample. It's in English that bears only a passing resemblance to the language you and I speak. According to Article 7 of Directive 96-92-EC, Member States must designate a system operator to be responsible for operating, ensuring the maintenance of, and if necessary, developing the transmission system in a given area and its interconnection with other systems, etc. Mind you, there are places in England where they write like this. We've all been globalised. It's very important and it's very dull. It's this official sort of language that's being promoted around the world by government bodies, multinational corporations and international associations. It's stripped out turns of speech and colourful idioms, deliberately so, because this is language designed to be easily understood internationally, and local terms could be confusing. This sort of globalisation, I think, could become a cemetery for English. Is anyone ever going to write a poem in this sort of language, or use it when they fall in love, or when they have a real row, or express any of the personal feelings they have. But thankfully, as English spreads around the globe, alongside its official use, it has developed rich vernacular varieties. English has been spoken in Singapore since the early 19th century. But after independence from Britain in 1958, Singapore went a step further, and English was made the official language of business and government. Besides its ability to unite an ethnically diverse population of Chinese, Malays and Indians, the economic potential of English was paramount. At school, children learn their own first language, but they must all learn English. An elite minority language has become the property of the whole population. Mm -hmm. hey, what time is your friend coming? Uh? Should be quite soon. I told him about 4.30. So. What's his name? Uh? Ludwig. Okay, Ludwig. Mm -hmm. But the day-to-day -day English that the people of Singapore actually speak is a far cry from the official English that the government wants them to learn. It's a vibrant, expressive dialect, nicknamed Singlish, full of vocabulary, grammar and inflections borrowed from the Singaporeans' native languages. Hey, you want to get a drink first now? Yeah, these people got Tao here. All right, where do you work? What do you do? Um, uh, investment. Uh, give advice on investment. Ah, yeah. oh, money. Uh, better than my father. Uh, business closing already, you know. <laughs> The economy is so bad. Okay. What does your father do? Huh? Yeah. Uh, engineer, engineering company in Singapore. Regional lah. So all the you know, Indonesia is not doing well, Thailand not doing well. Then you don't want to help me? Huh? You don't want to help ah? <coughs> not not my line lah. Not my kind of. Hmm. But he's your father ma. I know, I know. That's like you know, <laughs> have to. He brought but... you up there. But he said he said never mind. So okay, bro. <laughs> And this may be the irony of the global spread of English. The more widely it's spoken, the more it may fracture into local dialects, which become increasingly mutually unintelligible. People will make English their own, and in doing so, will make it something else. This has happened before, to Latin, which broke into French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanian. But English has always embraced variety and change, and it still does. And in the final part of our final program, I'll be looking at how English is behaving now, in this country. In this series, we've looked at how English began as an obscure tribal dialect 1500 years ago and became a language for the world, spoken more widely and with more variety than any other language in history. For this, the final part of the final program, I want to go down these islands to take soundings of the state of English in its homeland today. When English came here in the 5th century, it began to push the Celtic languages to the fringes, to the margins, to Wales, of course, to Cornwall, and here to the Outer Hebrides. And in all those places, it's hung on. I'm on Ness, at the northern tip of the Outer Hebrides. And the language around here, spoken by almost everyone, is Scots Gaelic. It's one of UNESCO's endangered languages, but so far, it's hung on almost miraculously. But now, after 1,500 years, it's facing its biggest battle ever against the still relentless advance of English.
Did you have English and Gaelic when you went to school, in Barnes Primary School? I can't remember, but I don't think I have had one word of English. This traditional Hebridean village was abandoned 30 years ago. The local population are now bilingual, but these adults grew up speaking only Gaelic and had to learn English at school. Yeah, I, I think we could, we could put it to ten, I would think, and part of the alphabet, but it wasn't a totally strange language to me, as I remember. Will we have a seat? Yeah, yeah. why not? I think I was totally bilingual by the time I left secondary school. My grandfather's generation uh, would speak English in a way different from what we would. We were very conscious that they were... That like they a were, literal translation. Yeah, that they were, as we would put it at that time, that they were less advanced in, in <laughs> yes, their use of yes, English yes, that's true, than we that's were. True. Um, they were thinking in, in Gaelic. There's still some of that today. Yeah. In, in the town, yeah, yeah. that it's after being or I was after talking to somebody yeah. or after being somewhere. Yeah. But, and there's the yourself oh, yes. and myself. Yourself. The use of yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. when, when two people would meet, say, it's yourself. <laughs> it's yourself. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, you feel yes. like saying no. Yes. Although youngsters nowadays, they've got oh, whatever oh, transfers yes. across from oh, the media. Yeah. But yeah. Um, if you're talking about something like pop music or something in the media that you've seen, you're not going to talk about it in Gaelic when it's been in English that you've actually seen it. But there's words in Gaelic which describe the situation so much better. For example, kianalus is home, well, it's more than homesickness. It's used to describe homesickness, but it takes in sort of nostalgia and sort of a lot of feeling more, more so than homesickness. And the same applies to old man. Uh, we would use the word bodoch, the old bodoch down the road, or the old, the old bodoch next door. I would speak Gaelic to my grandmother and my mother, but to my friends I speak English. Gaelic seems to have an image problem amongst the young people. I mean, we used to speak Gaelic all the time when we were in primary school, but if you have one person who comes into your class who speaks English, everybody has to change or that person's isolated. So uh, ever since then, I mean, we've been speaking English to everybody. We're just so used to it now. It's a habit. The English spoken here still has the tang of the Gaelic, but its edge is getting duller. It's sounding more and more gradually like the language of the mainland. But how stable is that? English continues to devil away up here. And if even Lewis weakens, can Glasgow be far behind? Glasgow has some of the most distinctive voices in Britain. Companies locate call centres here because they think that the softer version of the Glaswegian accent is one of the most trustworthy and friendly in the country. I'll send an email out to Resort and request that both reference numbers have rooms which are next to each other. Yeah, I'll do that. That's absolutely fine. So that would be half past four? Um, half past, yeah, half past four in the morning. The brochure will probably take between seven to ten days before it comes out. OK, so you can confirm today for £125. Pounds. And which is your nearest airport to go from? Kelvin Dock. But at its broadest, Glaswegian dialect is furthest away from standard English. It can be virtually incomprehensible to outsiders. Many dialects have eroded to the extent that they're just accents, but other dialects have retained their distinctive nature. Glaswegian is a dialect which is made up of a range, actually two different forms of English. Um, Scottish English, which was taken over in the 18th century, which is essentially standard English spoken with a Scottish accent and then Scots, which has its own distinctive historical development. For example, Old English, air, is head in standard English, so it's been retained, but in Scotland is e, so it's heed. Right.
Glasgow University sends researchers into the streets to monitor changes in speech. <laughs> right, so one at a time, just tell me what it says on that card. Heat. Heat. Hoose. Hoose. Old English oo is still in Scots today, so they say moose. What about the accent? Does that also change over time? Um, we have, for example, f for th. Now, in Cockney, it's very normal to say, f I think, but up here it isn't. However, it is now. Thank. 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 Butter. 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 Inevitably, there has been speculation that it's the media, that it's watching soaps, it's watching TV, and particularly Southern English forms of TV that are causing these changes. But there's a problem here. There's no real research to actually establish this empirically. Have you any examples of very recent new Glaswegian words? The one that we've been quite excited about is, is nip. It's a verb, and... Um, an example of nip would be, I nipped her, I saw her nipping him. Can you think of any words that you use in Glasgow that nobody else uses? Yeah. Nip. Nip. Yeah? What does nipping mean? No, no, no. Nip in the back. <laughs> <laughs> we don't exactly know what nip means. Um, it seems to mean something like kiss or snog, probably get off with. There's a lot of talk about this particular time, the last 25, the last 50 years, being the uh, period when regional accents retreated and began to die. What evidence do we have for that here? An accent is actually a combination of features. And um, so you can change certain features in the same way in Glasgow and in Reading. But because the original combination of features that you started off with in Reading and Glasgow were different, although you have the same changes for some of the features, the rest of the features are quite different, so the resulting mix will remain distinctive. So my feeling from looking at Glaswegian at the moment is that actually Glaswegian will retain its distinctiveness. As we've looked back at the adventure of English, we've steamed through centuries, and so we've been able to see sweeping changes in the vocabulary and the way it was used. But many changes in language have happened over a long period and in small steps, word by word and sound by sound. So when we look at the way language is changing now, all around us, it's not so easy to see the bigger picture or where the changes are leading, which currents or influences will mark out the future. One of the greatest causes of change in English has been its encounter with other cultures and other tongues. And these encounters are still happening today. My next stop is Bradford to see this in action. Bradford has one of the largest concentration of South Asian populations in Britain. There are about 1.7 million who have come to this country from South Asia, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, making it the biggest ethnic minority. Many of those who came in the first instance didn't speak English, but as their children were born here and went through the British school system, they did speak English. They do speak English at school at least. Here, they speak Yorkshire English. Welcome to the tale of a delicious adventure in a wonderful land. Kate, not that the name would tell much either way. She barely comes into the story. But if wishes were fishes, I bet we'd all throw them back. The first language of these children's parents and grandparents is usually Urdu or Punjabi, and that's often the language that the children speak at home. And these languages have greatly complicated and enriched the Yorkshire English they speak at school and on the streets. I speak half English and half uh, Punjabi when I'm talking to my mates. If I, if I know I can't say this word in English, I will say in my own language. Kasme means I swear, like... I swear I won't do that again. I found with my white friends and, uh, you know, like, accidentally I would say, cuss me, I, I really did this. And they say, what is cuss me? Then I'll say, it means I, I swear, I swear, you know, I'm being honest. When they use the word cuss me, it'll, it'll be, it's quite funny the way they say it. They'll go, cuss me, that happened. Um, you know, they'll, they'll use the language as well, very differently as well. They walk up to you and say, oh, uh, say, what's happening? And then they pick you up, or oh, what's happening? But they don't know they're saying the same thing. Or means what's happening? Then they'll say, or oh, what's yeah. happening in the same sentence. The only, well, Punjabi word we use when we're texting is or. The rest is all short English that you probably use when you're on the internet sending a message. 
English is borrowing, adopting, changing, altering words all the time, as we've seen throughout these programmes. It's a massive job keeping track of them, being, as it were, the keeper of words. If any one body deserves to be called the keeper of the English language, it's the Oxford English Dictionary. And that's my next stop. We've been travelling down the country from um, the Hebrides, the south, just taking soundings as to what the language is like these days, and I wondered how these figured in, the, uh, in your dictionary. From the uh, Outer Hebrides, there's Bodach, like an old man. An old man, yeah. And I believe that word actually still is in, is in, is in the Oxford English Dictionary, um, in the sense of an old... In a sense of, in, in a slightly earlier sense, um, a, a spectre, a spectral presence. In Glasgow, there's the word nip being used as to get off with. It's not in the dictionary yet, in that last sense, no. We haven't got enough evidence for it. We're, we're looking for fairly, fairly extensive uh, evidence from, from Glasgow or, or elsewhere. In Bradford, with the Punjabi and Urdu influence, there are several words. Um, Kazmi, meaning I swear, there's Ur, how's it going, and Chuddies, underpants. Chuddies is in the DOED already, possibly from, from, a, from a Hindi word. Um, as, and that's, achieved, that's one of these words that's achieved some sort of currency uh, through the media and through television. Um, and the other words that you mentioned, no, they're not in the dictionary yet. Um, again, this is a borderline area, um, the interface between cultures. It's always an, in, in, an in, interesting area uh, for linguistic description. And we'll tend to wait several years before a word finds some sort of uh, more established place in the language before we push it into the dictionary. The operation going on behind us here is a sort of scientific investigation of the language. Evidence starts coming into our card files and our computer files, which we're monitoring, and we can see that it, it's maybe significant. Because so much of language is just sort of sparks that, that, that disappear. Let's talk about slang, about bling bling. Bling bling, meaning, you know, ostentatious jewellery, or as an adjective relating to that, ostentatious wealth, and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, it, it crops up five or six years ago, uh, but, but this stayed around, so it's on the way into the dictionary. It's not there yet, but it's on the way in there. It's being, being reviewed by our uh, advisors or whatever at the moment. What about the um, relation between English English and American English and now other Englishes? The whole concept of different varieties of English is obviously more important now than it was, or more recognised now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so whereas at the time you might have thought of British English and American English as being the main features um, on, on the linguistic landscape, um, people talk about the different Englishes in, as a sort of uh, noun that you can count these days. So you can have a plural Englishes with American English, Australian English, Singaporean English, Indian English, etc., etc. And they've all got their own um, characteristics. So um, they're independent in many ways, but they also feed into a general um, uh, sort of internet English, if you like. What's the size of the dictionary at the moment? About 750,000 words. This is covering English from the Anglo-Saxon period up to the present day. You yeah, seem to have fairly tough requirements for taking words in. Do you ever dispense with words? Do you ever let words drop, kick them out? Um, we have a, a very simple rule for leaving, for, for, t for taking words out of the dictionary, and that is we don't. Once the word's in, in the, the full Oxford English Dictionary, um, it stays there because it's part of the history of the English language. Um, so once it's in, it's there. The, the, Have you got any favourite ones you want us to take out? <laughs> <laughs>
and on each disc there are brief greetings in 55 of the planet's languages. The only long message recorded by the then Secretary of the United Nations, Kurt Waldheim, is in English. I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught. English is on its way to the stars, but the story of English has also been one of constant changes in the language. It's never stood still, as we've seen. So if, a thousand years or more in the future, people meet life from other planets who've learned their 20th century English from Voyager, it'll sound as strange and archaic to English speakers here in the future as the earliest Anglo-Saxon does to us today. What? We garden in Yardawum. Theod Kuninger from Gefrunon, Uther Athelingus Ellen Fremedon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. <laughs>